Uh, this is called a precious Wendel trap, and Wendel trap, as I understand, is Dutch for spiral staircase. These live in uh, the tropical Pacific, from Japan down through the Philippines, probably all the way to Australia. Fairly deep water, um, living on, on the reefs. And during the heyday of collections during Victorian times and before when everybody had their natural history cabinets that included everything under the sun, stuffed animals, rocks, and shells. Shells were very big. This was a very much coveted shell and went for thousands of dollars, equivalent today to people who had the money to buy them. Um, as the story goes, the, the Chinese would make rice paste forgeries that were so authentic to the real thing that nobody knew the difference until, according to legend, uh, somebody decided their shell was a little too dirty and he washed it and it dissolved and went down the drain, which probably came as a major surprise to him. Nowadays, it's sort of the opposite. Um, as I said, the actual snail uh, shell itself is uh, fairly common. We know where to get it. But now it's the forgeries that are incredibly rare. And supposedly, one of the very last ones is under lock and key at the British Museum in London. This was used to demonstrate why people should use seat belts. And according to this, it was used at a farm science review as well as at shopping malls, fairs, etc. They would put an egg in this little seat, pull it back and release it, and show how the egg would shatter if you weren't, you weren't if wearing a seat belt. Egg wasn't wearing <laughs> exactly. Seat belt. And then there's a seat belt here where they would put a seat belt on the egg and then they would do the same thing and of course the egg would survive and would last. Uh, reminiscent of things that have... Okay, so under here looks like the bellows and whatnot. So this comes out. Yeah, this goes down. That drops down. Yeah. So this comes down. Oh, oh here we go. Be careful. Isn't this bizarre? So it it was actually to get along on a submarine. Mm -hmm. it, oh, See. there you go. See, alrighty. <gasps> and then, and then, you sit oh, and then these, actually, okay. Come up that way. There. Oh, oh I see. No, and that's your pump. No, yeah. this clips oh, that, on mm -hmm. here. Oh, okay, here's the little hook. Right. Well, now you can just play as a tune. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm a piano, I was a piano. Well, this was another aircraft one here, and it's a uh, computer air navigation cruise control climb and descent tabulator. With these, depending on how you set the thing up here, uh, it was called a rest computer range, endurance, speed, and time. And with what fuel you had left on the particular aircraft that this was designed to to work on, this uh, uh, this one was worked with a certain engine here, a J33 engine back in those days and with a JP3 fuel. Uh, and so with this then, from any given spot and altitude, you could either set the thing, set your airplane up and get the data you needed to uh, run the thing for maximum endurance or for the best speed or for your maximum time in the air. And the R then would give you the range that you had with that amount of fuel at that altitude. So this gave you a lot more flexibility on computing things very rapidly. Uh, in the cockpit than you uh, than you could otherwise. So uh, these were very good. These were made up for all, all the first of the jet aircraft had these as sort of standard. The old uh, P-80 that the Air Force had, T-33 it was called in the Navy and Marine Corps, uh, used these things uh, very extensively and so that was used as part of our training. Other people, there's a single object that they that they exist in, or they would have been forgotten. There's a, like a single object that keeps who they are and the fact that they existed with us. My name is Lori Stewart, and my father is Robert Ginther. For probably 37 years, he was a appliance repairman for the Sears Roebuck Company. He was a paleontologist by hobby, and my husband had gone to Ohio State University. We knew Dr. Osich and I contacted him and they were more than tickled to be able to get my father's fossil collection. It's very satisfying. Um, it's what my father want, would have wanted. 
um, is to have his collection out where people can look at it, touch it, talk about it, um, learn from it. He was curious and a lover of information. Um, a discoverer, almost, if you would, if you would want to put it that way. A seeker of knowledge. That was my dad. Yeah. Always a thirst for knowledge. There is a room, and I sort of call it the university room. And so the room is hung almost like a boardroom. It has um, portraits of deans and presidents and, you know, you name it, and some um, sculptural busts as well, portrait busts. And for me, as a, having been a student at OSU, I see the names Pressy and Mendenhall and Orton, and I think of buildings. But of course, they were named after important people. But then really, at the heart of the university, and I think this is one of our sort of maybe less tangible interests, at least for me, is that at the heart of something that's so big and so structured and, and um, massive is really the whole intellectual and creative endeavor of change, of turning over old ideas, of finding new ideas, of new creative forms, and, and um, you know, discovering new things about our world. And that's a very fluid thing, and there's even this almost ebb and flow of students that come and go. So there's a kind of fluidity to it, and it's not so easily visualized. And so, you know, as a curator, how do you, how do you make, how do you give that a physical presence too? And when we were at the Wexner Center, we saw um, a whole collection of Chihuahua antelope headdresses. They began to sort of personify for me that beauty and fluidity of, of the intellectual endeavor and the creative endeavor that really is what the university really is all about. And so in the middle of that university room is um, a herd of antelope. <laughs> This is a very faux division, this idea that art lives on one, you know, in one quarter and science particularly lives in another quarter. Those two things really are very much connected. And in fact, the more we know about artists and scientists, they think in many, they often think in very similar ways. Their thinking process, the way they problem solve. Artists and scientists are very related that way. OSU is a powerhouse of a university in the sciences, in arts, in culture, in medicine. And to bring it all together in our wonderful downtown Columbus Museum of Art is really a, a way for our community to come in and see the power and the beauty that is Ohio State.